The session is completely free of charge. At the end of the session, we will give you details of the Spanish charity Age in Spain, which cares for older people if you would like to make a donation. I've just got a few words to say by way of introduction. I walked my very first Camino from Seville to Santiago in January 2007. It took me 36 days. I was carrying too much weight and therefore I got lots of blisters. However, they didn't put me off and after a few weeks I wanted to walk again. I thought of the Camino Inglés which I'd heard of from Ferrol and I asked the confraternity of St James in London if they had any information about the route. They gave me old walking notes which had been written by a member, but not only were they out of date, but when I walked the route, I discovered that the course of the route had changed and that there were very few yellow arrows and those that were there were faded to the point of being non-existent. When I told the CSJ this, they said, John, why not write a guidebook to the Camino Inglés? And so I did. To write a new guidebook, one has to walk the route at least three times, as well as researching history and accommodation. I did this, and in 2008, my first guidebook to the Camino Inglés was published. In that year, 1,223 pilgrims walked from Ferrol to Santiago. When I walked, I simply arrived in towns and, and villages and looked for a bed. No booking ahead was necessary. Then, as now, the municipal albergues didn't take bookings anyway. Often, there were so few pilgrims, just over a thousand pilgrims, people were surprised to see me, to see any pilgrim, and nobody spoke English. At that time, in the guidebook, I included the route from Acarunia, but very few pilgrims walked from, walked from there because at that time, it was not possible to obtain a Compostela. The guidebook sold well, and the profits all went to the confraternity of St. James, and the Camino Inglés grew in popularity. Last year, 23,000 pilgrims walked from Ferrol, and now, of course, pilgrims may obtain the Compostela by walking at least 25 kilometres in their own country before walking from Coruña. That first guidebook led to many others. Two years ago, I decided that I had enough of writing guidebooks, and I'm delighted that my good friend and already published guidebook author agreed to continue them. Mark has walked the community in Glass and has produced a fully updated guidebook, and I'm delighted he is here today to talk to us. Over to you, Mark. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, let me just share my screen. Oh, wait. Can you see my screen now? Let me just... Yes, we can. Okay, right. Let me go back to it. Okay, so the Camino Inglés is the English way, but it's more than the English way. Um, it can trace its origins back to the early Middle Ages when pilgrims from all over Northern Europe um, would make a very treacherous sea journey to the Gleithian ports of either Acruña, Farol, Ribadeo, or Vivero, in order to make the pilgrimage to the remains of St. James the Apostle. Although commonly referred to as the English way, um, it could be just as easily be the Irish way, the Scandinavian way. So whether you're from Ireland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Scotland, Wales, this is your way. And even from North America, you're more than welcome to join us on this way. Now, there's a connection to Guinness. Uh, the Guinness Brewery in Dublin is famously known as the St. James's Gate Brewery. And the reason it's called the St. James's Gate Brewery is because it's next to the medieval St. James's Gate. And the reason that was called the St. James's Gate is because that's where the pilgrims, the Middle Ages, would set sail for Santiago. So they would set sail and probably either arrive in Acruña or Ribadeo or Ferrol and then walk to Santiago the last 100 or 150 kilometres or so. Yeah. Um, there's still a connection now. The um, Irish uh, confraternity um, has a base in the church, which is called St. James's Church. Um, and you can get your 
uh, Camino passport from there. You can get an Irish Camino passport for a cost of 10 euro, which may be a little bit expensive, but it's used to fund the Irish Friends of St. James. Um, after that, you, if you want, you can then do a tour of the Guinness Brewery and get your first stamp from the Guinness Brewery. So where about is the Camino Inglés? So Galicia, where Santiago is based, is um, basically the top left-hand corner of Spain. So it's the bit above Portugal. Uh, and Santiago is roughly about there. You can see where my pointer is, yeah? Now, the Camino Inglés, as we normally walk it, starts in Ferrol, which is up here, which is a uh, Spanish military. Uh, it's where the Spanish Navy has a huge base. Um, and you can see here, you start in Ferrol, you walk around the, the estuary down and then basically make your way down through over about five or six days and eventually arrive in Santiago. There is an alternative route, which is not well walked, um, but starts in Acoruña, which I think is probably my preferred route. It only takes about four days, uh, but to qualify for Compostela, you must walk uh, 25 kilometers in your home country, but anywhere in your home country, and get at least one stamp. So, how does it compare with the Camino Frances, say, from Syria? So, unless you take a short course across the railway bridge, you're probably going to need six days rather than five days. Yeah, so it takes probably an extra day to walk Camino Inglés. Um, although you can take a shortcut and make it into a five-day Camino. It's at least a picture, picturesque, um, and it brings in some coastal views, which you don't get on the Syria to Santiago route. There are more hard services when walking the Inglés, but the vast majority of these are on country lanes with virtually no traffic. Um, and you don't have the need for um, waterproof footwear, uh, which you do in the when you walk in Syria to Santiago during the muddy months. Um, it's more peaceful. You don't get the large groups of young people with Bluetooth speakers blasting away with whatever music they particularly prefer at the moment. It's probably not as well facilitized. Well, it's definitely not as well facilitized, although that is improving in terms of bars and accommodation options. Um, there's at least one stretch of more than 13 kilometers without any bars. So it can be useful to carry a little bit more water, especially if you're walking in the summer. Just a quick look at what's happening in terms of pilgrim numbers. Um, They've gone from, say, 2005, when you had less than 1,000 pilgrims, um, up to about 18,000 pilgrims a year. And it's on a fairly steady increase each year. So it's becoming increasingly popular uh, year on year uh, because it allows you to walk an entire Camino, um, but only in six days. Whereas you want to do the Camino Frances, you're looking at 33 to 35 days, which a lot of people just can't afford that kind of time. Um, this is my packing list, and I will make that available for anybody who wants it. I'll, I'll make the slides available to anybody who wants the slides as a PDF. Um, but what I do with my packing list, and I've, I've said this is a winter packing list, in fact, it's a, an autumn packing list or a spring packing list. What I tend to do is I weigh every item um, using kitchen scales to get a very accurate measurement and then just put them into a spreadsheet so I can work out ahead of time how much I'm going to carry. I carry, I'm fairly, I can carry a fairly large weight. So I carry quite a large pack, in this case, about eight kilograms, um, which in the summer it's a little bit lighter, but I think if you, I think most people you want to be targeting about six to seven kilograms, uh, so about a thirty to forty liter pack. There are some people who think to be a true pilgrim that you must carry your own pack. Um, I personally don't like the concept of being a true pilgrim uh, because I think it misses the point of pilgrimage, in that pilgrimage. I personally believe 
is something that um, is that God does for us, not that we do for God. So even if you're religious, I always think it is being a gift and it's a gift given to everybody freely. Um, pilgrimage is a special time to reflect uh, on life and to basically be at one with the world. So whether you carry a pack or not, I don't think it's vital to that. But carrying a pack does give you freedom. So especially if you're traveling out of main season, um, you can pick and choose how far you're going to walk if you carry your own pack. So there's lots of advantages to carrying your own pack. And I typically carry my own pack um, unless I'm with an organized group, uh, in which case I probably just arrange for it to be shipped. Um, on the Camino Inglés, we know that there's the Spanish postal office, Correos, um, who definitely do the shipping of the packs on the Camino Inglés. And I believe uh, last summer there were one or two independent um, shipping companies who uh, allowed you to ship your pack. So you may choose to just ship your pack for a, a day or two on a particularly difficult stretch, um, or you may choose to carry your pack the whole way, or you may choose to have your pack ship, shipped every day. The choice is yours. It really doesn't affect the the spirit of the pilgrimage, whether you ship it or carry it. Um, as I say, personally, I prefer to carry it because of the freedom. I really like the freedom, but uh, freedom is only really available in the these days. In the if you go on Camino, kind of out of season, out of the main season. So, when is the season for the Camino Inglés? Well, it's different to the Camino Francés. Uh, for the Camino Francaise, the biggest and most busiest month is September. But for the Camino Inglés, it's August. Um, uh, well, August and July. So August and July, if you're going in those kind of months, um, you really want to probably pre-book ahead your accommodation. Um, peak week is obviously the week leading up to the Feast of St. James, which is July 25th. Um, and that's when there will be peak accommodation uh, right across. 95% um, of all Camino Inglés pilgrims start in Ferrol. Very few pilgrims currently choose the uh, A Coruña leg, which is a bit of a shame because I think it's probably a nicer leg. So what's the first day like out of Ferrol? Um, I normally split this and stay in Nader. So you walk around the bay um, and it, it's generally quite nice walking. Uh, you see a few boats. Uh, it gets a bit disappointing as you kind of uh, turn the corner here and get towards Nader. That that bit stretch there is not, not so nice. Um, but once you've hit Nader, you kind of, the rest of the Camino is either countryside or down by the sea like it is down here. So the next day um, is Ponte Dume is again a nice short day, 15.4 kilometers. Um, they used to be, the route used to come down by the beach here at Cabanas, but it was rerouted a few years ago. I'm not quite sure why. Um, and that kind of uh, reroutes you. And then you walk over the nice bridge into the beautiful town of Ponte Dume. So what's that like in terms of a walk? Well, it, because you're walking around the bay, it's a very flat walk um, until just before uh, you get towards Ponte Dume, where there's a, a bit of a hike um, and you get an elevation of about 150 meters, which moderately demanding, but not too much. So that's a, if you wanted to, you could walk that all in one day if you were reasonably fit but i think 30 kilometers for your first day is quite challenging so what about for all in terms of accommodation there's no albergue yet uh, but the funding has been secured to create an albergue in what's known as the casa de pescador but we don't know when that's going to be available there's a really excellent parador uh, which are um, hotels which are government owned and in kind of national monuments 
uh, in uh, Ferrol, and it's reasonably well priced. So if you want to treat yourself, you can stay in the Parador. There's lots of good value hotels, uh, in two, including two from the Alder Group, which offer very good value. Um, Ferrol has a pretty old town uh, down by the harbour, but most of Ferrol is it's kind of down. It's it's um, down on its look a little bit, and probably could do what we'd say in England a bit of leveling up. Um, and it's not as a nice and a thriving and a vibrant city compared with Acorunia, which is basically a much nicer city. Uh, the starting point is down by the harbour, and at the starting point there is a pilgrim office there where you can get your credentials um, and you can get your first stamp. On the first day, when you walk to Neda, uh, a couple of things. The municipal or junta albergue uh, is very good, um, but you have to walk around the back of it to the door at the back um, to get the phone number to phone up the hospitaler who will come along, will give you the code to get in, and then come along a few hours later to collect the money. There's a very good pension called Pension Margotto there as well. Um, if you are staying in the albergue, the nearest facilities are back across this double hoop bridge. Uh, it's only about a four minute walk and there's good facilities. Um, there's also a couple of hotels in uh, Shuvia, which is the bit just before you cross over into Neda. Um, despite the, the stone mark is showing uh, Neda is 99 kilometers, Neda is officially recognized as um, the last starting point that qualifies for a Compostela. So if you wanted to stay there and walk only 99 kilometers or 98 kilometers, you would still get a Compostela if you want to start from Neda and avoid the walk out of Ferrol. Um, Ponte Dume, which is the next big town. It's a very co a pretty coastal town has all the facilities. Uh, there's a good municipal albergue. Um, there's an, sorry, there's, the municipal albergue is very basic there, uh, but is very central. Um, my preferred preference is the new albergue called Rio Ume, um, which has kind of these pod types beds uh, rather than the normal bunk beds. Um, and there's a really good restaurant, which they'll point you to, which does very good uh, pilgrim meals at a really good price. Um, there's a lovely hotel, um, but it, it's halfway up the hill out of Ponte Dume. And that's a very steep hill coming out of Ponte Dume in the morning. So the third stage um, from Ponte Dume to Batanzos, um, is a um it's a nice a lot of this is very nice country walking then you get a nice little bit of coastal walking around uh minyo as you, as you come down towards minyo um there are a couple of places you can stop off and get uh get a coffee or a tea uh, or a coke along the way um there's plenty of facilities in minyo you want to go into town um it's a nice 21.4 kilometers is a, is, is a nice, relatively easy day. And again, it's fairly flat. Um, these elevations are about 100 meters, which isn't, that climb up Ponte Dume in the morning feels quite tough. But after that, it's fairly rolling. It's not too tough. Um, and you end up down by the coast here. Um, and then down by the coast again, as you come into Batanzos. Tanzos is gorgeous. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, it dates back to Roman times when it was known as Flavium Bringat Bringatimium. Um, it has a really nice central square with a good choice of restaurants. There's a Junta albergue, which is okay and good, but there's a really nice new parish albergue, which is owned by the Archdiocese of Santiago, but is run by the Camino uh, Society in Mallorca. Um, and I think that would be the top tip of a, a place to say there would be the um, parish albergue there. 
it, it looks really, really nice. And it only opened about two years ago. Um, there's some nice hotels, but they are more expensive. Um, there isn't much kind of pension type accommodation uh, that you might find in other locations. So you're either in an albergue or you're paying for quite an expensive hotel. Um, there is one pension, which is a bit out of town. Um, and they, they will give you a lift in and out of town, but I probably wouldn't recommend it. I'd probably go for one of the, the hotels in town if I wanted private accommodation there. Um, the fourth stage is from Batanzos to uh, Hospital de Bruma, or if you want some private accommodation in Mesa de Uventu. Um, there's not so many facilities on this. Um, Although in halfway in Prestedo, um, uh, there's a quite a nice um, restaurant, which has kind of got a Camino theme to it. Um, and that's a great place to stop off for lunch. Um, there's been some uprating of the facilities by the um, uh, reservoir at Beche. Uh, and I think they have, they, there may be some accommodation becoming available in Beche as well. Um, in Presedo, there's only a very small um, municipal type albergue, which has been recently renovated, but it is only about, I don't know, 13 beds or something like that. Um, so if you want to split this day, um, there are a couple of options. I'll tell you about those a little bit later. Um, now, this day, the end of this day is really quite tough. Um, and you feel like you've been climbing all day. And at the very end of the day, you come across a nice little bar in Astravesas. Um, and that's it's called uh, Avelinas. And that is kind of like you know you've kind of hit it. And from there, you can either split to Ossible Bruma or Meson and Vento. Um, but that's kind of like a big traditional bar that you get a really good welcome there. Um, very, very friendly owner. So just a little bit more about um, Prosedo. Um, this is the only option if you want to split the day and do it in kind of half stages. Um, I say the municipal albergue is only about 13 beds. It has been renovated recently. Um, but if you want private accommodation, basically what you've got to do is um, book into either Casa Monolo, uh, which is um, which is fine, nice little private um, a pension uh, um, at a reasonable price, or you want to go to a bit more upmarket. There's somewhere called Retrol the Cines. Um, now that is about seven or eight kilometers and Casamonola is about five kilometers away. So you basically have to get a taxi there and a taxi back, um, which is not too expensive. Um, and you can wait in the uh, very interesting um, cafe bar stroke museum in Presedo while you get your taxi there and you just get your taxi back in the morning. Possible, Bru Possible Bruma has, um, it's a tiny hamlet. Uh, it has the Junta albergue, so the municipal albergue, and the private one. Um, there's a bar, one bar there, which does a really good pilgrim menu for just nine euro. Um, or it, at least last year it was just nine euro. It may have gone up since then. Um, the Junta albergue is quite basic, but is open all year. Um, the climb up to Bruma is, is very tough and is probably the toughest part of the whole Camino Inglés. Um, and just before Bruma, both parts of the Camino Inglés come together and you get, uh, and you basically know you they've come together at Bar Avelina, which is this that nice little bar I was telling you about. Um, and if the bar owner is not too busy, she'll take you across the way um, to a little tour of a, a 19th century Pilgrim Chapel just across the road. The alternative is just to carry on past, uh, rather than turn off into Hospital Broom, it's carry on uh, about another kilometre or two to Messalavento, 
Um, it has a hotel, which is used by both truckers and pilgrims, a couple of B&Bs, small shop, a pharmacy, and even an ATM if you need some cash. Um, it's, if you want to stay in private rooms, it's the only option. So there's nothing in hospital rumour uh, if you want a private room. So you just have to go to Messinal Vento. Um, in the following morning, it's about another two kilometres to rejoin up with the main Camino Inglés if you choose to stay in Messinal Um The fifth stage uh, goes through... Um, start from Hospital um, to Bruma. Um, if you want to break this day up, you can go to, you can take a detour into Ordez and stay in Ordez. There's all facilities in Ordez. Um, otherwise, it, you can, there is some accommodation in Utero, and that way you could split it that way. Um, but you have a big gap after Alcalia in terms of um, there's nowhere else to stop. Uh, and get a break so this is one where you really want to make sure you've got some water with you if you're walking the route the official route's been rerouted in the last couple of years um and instead of going down uh behind uh a basically a, a wood here it takes you down by the main road um it's okay, the path's okay, and there's a little bar hidden away there if you want to stop off somewhere. Uh, but I would strongly recommend taking the alternative routes there. Um, and there are special instructions of how to find the alternative routes. It's basically when you come under the, uh, the highway, um, you'll be signposted off to the right. If you ignore that first signpost and carry on down and basically take the next right, it's a much nicer route into Seguro. Seguro is not far from Santiago Airport and is almost really basically the suburbs of Santiago. As you can see, it's a relatively easy day, uh, gently drifting downhill, a couple of uphills. You obviously along the route, you've got to do some uphills. Um, but it gently kind of brings you down to Seguero, which is quite well facilitized. Um, this hospital, Bruma Seguero, it's the longest day. Um, there's an albergue and BAB in Otero. Um, the route to Seguero isn't well facilitized. So make sure you have either some, well, definitely make sure you have some water and you may want to have some snacks with you. Um, it's much nicer to take the old route, as I say, those last five kilometers. Um, you've got a good selection of albergues and a private accommodation when you get to Seguero, um, but it's effectively Seguero is a suburb of Santiago. The final day, um, despite being, you know, coming from almost basically a suburb of Santiago, you do get some nice kind of countryside walking um, until you get to the, um, industrial estate where it kind of gets basically you're in you're in the city and you've kind of got to follow go through some less attractive areas um there is the famous um enchanted woods that you walk through uh as you go through uh i think it's about oh i think it's about here somewhere about here um it's a relatively flat day so it's not too uh, stressful eventually you read you reach santiago um couple of recommendations for santiago um in terms of albergues either albergue km0 which is on the same road that the pilgrim office is in or the albergue la stamp um best hotel i think uh, is Hospitalia San Martin Pinaro, which is the old senior seminary. Um, they have some uh, special pilgrim rooms, which are haven't been renovated, uh, but you can get for a, a rate of just twenty five euro a night uh, for a private room, including breakfast, which is amazing value, uh, especially since the albergues are now charging about 
20, 22 euros a night to stay in Santiago. Things to do in Santiago. My favorite is the Pilgrimage Museum. Uh, the Cathedral Rooftop Tour is amazing. The Porta de Gloria, uh, which is the old entrance into the cathedral, uh, which you'd see in the film on uh, the way. Um, that I think is a, is a, a nice to see or, or, or must see. Um, also the Pilgrim Mass in, in the cathedral, which is at 11 o'clock each day. Um, and in the summer, there's a pretty good chance you'll see the Botafumera, which is the massive thurible uh, being swung at most masses, at most pilgrim masses, that 11 o'clock mass. There's no guarantee on it. Depends if somebody will pay for it. Um, but often in the summer, it's pretty much swung every day. Um, if you're staying for a couple of days, I would uh, recommend the English mass as a way to kind of wind down after your pilgrimage. Uh, that's held in the pilgrim office. And of course, the reason of going to Santiago is to visit the bones of St. James in the in the bottom of the cathedral. So right under the altar, um, you can walk down there. In terms of my favorite foods, when I go to Santiago, my favorite is the small, small scallops called Zambarinhas. Um, also like uh, garlic prawns, um, uh, Spanish parma ham uh, is jamon, jamon iberica or pata negra, uh, and it's just amazing. Um, and I also like the Galician cheese, particularly the Uloa, which is a very creamy, uh, very soft cheese. Um, in terms of wines to taste, if you like wines, uh, Albariño is an excellent Galician white wine. Um, and Bierzo is a bread wine just next to Galicia. So the bread wines are any Bierzo are generally very good. It's the same grape as you find in Rioja. So it's very, very similar to Rioja. Uh, and of course, my favorite beer is called Estrella Galicia 1906. So when you get to Santiago, you can celebrate with this. There are, are, uh, there are streets and streets of great restaurants there. Um, and there are lots and lots of places to try um, and, and great food. It's a beautiful city. Um, it was one of the richest cities in the world uh, in medieval times and still keeps its kind of medieval feeling, its medieval heart. It's a wonderful city to go and visit. Um, just talking about alternatives, um, you can start from A Coruña. From A Coruña to Santiago is 73 kilometers. Uh, to qualify for the Compostela, you need to walk an extra 25 kilometers in your own country, yeah? Um, to verify that, you must produce just one stamp from your home country uh, and your pilgrim office will take your word for the distance. So whether you walk it or whether you don't, it's really down to you. As long as you've got a stamp, they'll, they'll say yes to it. Um, I would suggest it's probably better to obtain a couple of stamps from your home country and maybe a little Google map to say what distance was. If you're coming from Britain, you can get uh, stamps in churches, post office and banks. In Acoruña, the start is this uh, church of Santiago in Acoruña. Um, Acoruña is just gorgeous. It's a very, very uh, lively city. The walkout um, is long, but it's not it's not unpleasant. It's actually quite a nice walkout. It takes about 14 kilometers to hit the countryside. Um, the main stopping point for the first leg out there is a place called Surgude, which is right out in the country. Uh, the only place to stay is the Junta or Municipal Albergue, but it's probably the best Municipal Albergue I've ever stayed at. There's a small little bar just down the road run by a lady called Ludis who will feed and water you well. There's only about 400 pilgrims a year who've been doing this Corunya leg. So, you know, it's a really, really nice little leg, which probably deserves some consideration. The elevation is very kind coming out of our Corunya to Sogude. It's only a 20 kilometer uh, stretch as well. So it's a, it's a nice, easy first day. Uh, the next day you go from Sogude to Hospital Bruma, it's only 
13 and a half kilometers. It's really beautiful countryside, but it's got one huge climb out of it. Um, so it may be a short day, but it's quite a tough day. Um, there's only two places to stop along the way, um, Cafe Bar Centre in Sarandos, and then the excellent bar, Avelina, which we talked about in our Trevesas just before Hospital of Bruma. So you can see that is, you, the climb there is 350 metres. That's quite a, quite a chunk of a climb. Uh, so it's a short day, but it's a tough day, but it's lovely countryside. And then you just follow the same route in. Um, recommendations for vlogs that are worth watching in advance. Uh, Sarah Dumas, uh, she does some excellent video. She does an excellent video on the Camino Inglés, as does Efren. And there's an English lady called Julia, the Adventure Geek. She's done the Camino Inglés as well. Um, and those are the links to her uh, videos. Question is, how do you get to either Ferrol or A Coruña? If you're coming from the UK, from the southeast, we now have some direct flights from Gatwick to Santiago, uh, even some flights from Gatwick to A Coruña, uh, and flights from Stansted to Santiago. Um, now, you need to watch out about some of the flights because they're arriving too late. Um, you won't be able to get to Ferrol that day. So you end up get, uh, incurring an extra night in Santiago. So it's much better to get a morning flight um, than it is to get a late flight. Although sometimes the late flights can be cheaper. You end up paying for an extra night in the hotel. It's just not worth it. And then, um, other options. So this particularly applies anybody coming from North America. Um, and a kind of generic route is to fly to Madrid, yeah? So from the south, you can get from Gatwick, Stansted, Heathrow, anywhere to Madrid. Um, lots of good options there. I'll make these slides available with the detail in it, but um, I just wanted to focus a little bit, uh, again, from the north of the UK, um, you've got Manchester to Madrid, and you've got the option of Ryan at least to Dublin, and then Dublin to Santiago. From the north in Scotland, you've got Edinburgh to Santiago and uh, Edinburgh to Madrid. From Ireland, probably the best option is the uh, Lingus flight from Dublin to Santiago. Um, it gets in about 10 past four in the afternoon, and that should give you enough time to get to either Acoruña or Ferrol without incurring an overnight stay. So, North America, Best option is to fly to Madrid um, rather than trying to get flights to Santiago or A Coruña because uh, they'll charge you an arm and leg to kind of uh, go to Santiago or A Coruña. Um, there are shuttle flights from Madrid to Santiago with both Ryanair and Iberia. Um, but what the way I would recommend to travel is the new fast train service. So you can get... Um, Fast trains to Acoruña about every two hours during the day. Um, and then from Acoruña, you, you can get to Ferrol. There is one direct service a day from Madrid to Ferrol, um, which if you if flight ties up with that time, that's great. That makes it a lot easier. But if you're getting an early morning flight in from North America, you may be better get one of these, getting the train to Acoruña, which is it's very quick. It's about three hours. Um, and then from A Coruña, um, you walk across to the bus station and then you can get a bus every half hour to Ferrol. Um, to get to Madrid Airport, um, to Madrid Charmatan, there's a railway link in the Terminal T4 um, and you get either C1 or C10 line or you can just grab a taxi which takes about 20 minutes and costs about 30 euro. I normally cheat and just grab a taxi. If you fly into Santiago, you can get a taxi direct from Ferrol to Santiago, costs about 120 euro. Um, you can alternatively get a taxi to the 
uh, railway station or intermodal station. So it's a bus and train station combined. From the airport, it was 21 euro. I think it's just gone up to 23 euro. Um, and then it's eight euro on the bus. Um, and you've got buses at two o'clock, four o'clock, six o'clock, 7.30 and 8.30 uh, with one bus from Santiago to Ferrol. If you fly into A Coruña, you get a direct taxi to Ferrol, which costs about 60 euro. Yeah, yeah. Or you can get a taxi to the Coruña bus station, which is about 16 euro. And then the buses go again every half hour, which is about five euro. So that concludes the slides. Shall we move to the questions? Yeah, taxi, the taxi fare has gone up to 23 euro. Mm. Yeah, Aer Lingus from Dublin is a very good option. Mm. So, yeah, Granze.com is a great uh, resource for, for accommodation. Um, and can I just say, Mark, yeah. People using the Grons website, www.grons.com. It's a Spanish website, but please do not be put off by this. The accommodation listings and the little maps of the route are perfectly understandable. And it has the facility, just like other apps, of you can just click and go straight through to uh, the booking facility of a hotel or a hostel. It's a very, very good website run by pilgrims. Yeah, so Grande is a, a go-to. Uh, it's a shame that it is in Spanish because it does seem to put an awful lot of people off, which is, it, it, you can use the automatic translation. Uh, it is, um, it's a great resource. Uh, how were to split Hostel de Bruma to Siguero? Uh, I found for you, but not sure. Sure. Okay. So, um, well, there are there are accommodation facilities beyond Bruma in the direction of Santiago on the route. Yeah. So there's a, there's a Casa Rural eight kilometres from Bruma, and there's another Casa Rural a few kilometres further on. I can't remember the name of it, but then Utero Utero. They're listed in Mark's guidebook, and of course yeah. also listed on on Grons. Uh, dot com. Yeah. So you can split that day. I think there's a lot of people want to walk this, but split it into, you know, five or ten uh, into ten days, which I think is, is fine. And the question, the best way to get to Santiago Airport from the city centre is there's a bus every 30 minutes starting at 6 a.m. in the morning. So you need to get a taxi if you've got a very early morning flight and you want to get to the airport at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. But bus number 6A, now the airport, bus, the airport bus system has changed and it's bus number 6A and it leaves from the, the Rua Horio, uh, which mm. is on the left-hand side of the Plaza de Galicia and the cost is one euro. Oh, got it. Thank you very much. I stayed at the uh, Hotel Santiago in Rua Horio. <laughs> the, um, coming from the US, tips for charging an iPhone. Well, I use an iPhone and I just plug it in and it charges. Um, you need to make sure you've got the adapter for the Spanish two pin plugs, but that's it. Oh, you oh, oh, just got a hand up. Oh, Hannah wants to give us a few tips. <laughs> Hi, Johnny. Hello. Can you hear me? Well, yeah, but we can't see you. Oh, sorry, sorry. Hold on. Let me start the video. Here we go. Now this this lassie comes from the Basque country, but she the lived, Basque country. She Basque country in, grew up lived, in Venezuela and lived in Ireland for the last seventeen years. She lives in Ireland now. Yeah, um, no, just because I haven't done the Camino from Ferrol since two thousand and three, I, I only met that time only about hmm. six pilgrims along the way. So anyway, I'm going to do now the Coruña onwards. 
but I have a few tips that I know because I've been going up and down around Santiago and uh, I help with the Betan the Betanzos, the uh, Father Jaume de, de Coruña, eh, de Coruña, de Mallorca, Albergue, and it's something that I want to say for some pilgrims uh, that they get tired to Betanzos, that that Albergue has a lift. It has three story, it's a three story Albergue, but it has a lift just in case anyone needs it. All right. And uh, it has great views and you are in the top floor of the albergue as well. Um, the tortilla is great. Then the other thing is just a few people are saying about pilgrims about uh, from Maison de Bento to, from Bruma to Maison de Bento. I know a friend told me that recently he was doing that and he got the hotel, I think it's called Canaima Hotel, which is yes. the, the troop one. And they have a service. If you are too tired, they can collect you in Maison de Vento if you tell them the time. And they bring you back the day after to the start again to make on the event. And, and better still, Bar Avelina will telephone yes. the Hotel Canaima to ask exactly. them to come and collect you. Exactly. But what they're doing now, the hotel, you have to tell them in advance the time. They won't call you on the day. So if you book, you have to tell them at least in the morning if you more or less estimate the time. That's why my friend called me, all right? And um, another thing for the end of the And just remember that if you yes. do that, to qualify for the Compostela, you have to go back to the That's point. That's what I said. The Canaima, the, the Canaima Hotel, they can bring you back to keep going back to yes. Maison de Vento and then you can come back if you want the day after. All right. And then uh, when you get to the end of the Camino at the Pilgrim office, there's two little things that a lot of pilgrims get there and they want to go to the mass and they don't know what to do with the locker and they are rushing to the um, Correos to leave the bag. There are, since last year, I think it's last year, or the year before, I can't remember. I think it's last year. There's new lockers in the pilgrim office. Wonderful. And you need a two euro coin for the locker. Is the one that you put the, the coin yep. and uh, you have your key. You don't have to look for anybody in security. And to give an idea, it could fit three, three or if three 25, 35 kilo uh, liters uh, backpacks. So if you're a group for two years, you can have two or three. I have a friend as well, I saw them last year with the pilgrim, the bike packs, and they have three, uh, the, I can't remember how you call it, they, for the bikes as well, they have three of them. So it, it's pretty big, like if you have, if you want to do the storage and keep your own key. The only thing is just work, you can leave it for one day or two or three or four. And there's some pilgrims that decide to go at the beginning, they arrive to Santiago, yeah. leave it stuff there, and they only carry their bag from the beginning of the, the Camino, thanks, and they have thanks. Esu. Thanks, I, I, Hannah. Yeah. Thank you yeah, very much. Sure, bye. There's a question. Food options on the Camino Inglés for those with dietary restrictions. Um, in Galicia, there's no problem. Get, there will be fish on every menu, um, and certainly salads on every menu. Um, so I... I, I, I I mean, I, I just can't foresee there being there being a difficult difficulty, and octopus, of course. Uh, Antonio's rem rem reminding us about the pulpo. <laughs> For those of you who like who like your uh, seafood with tentacles, the pulpo yeah. is there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, somebody asked about how to get from Coruña Airport to Ferrol. Um, the taxi is quite expensive because you have to go around the bay, so it's about sixty euro. Alternatively, you can get a taxi into, into A Coruña, which costs about 16 euro, and then get a bus from there, which costs about five euro, and they run every half hour. The last bus is about 10 o'clock at night. Very good. Are there any other questions? Oh. Mark has one last slide to show us. Do you? One second. The Santiago locker storage with the key is in the pilgrim's office. So you don't need to go any further if you're going straight to the pilgrim's office to collect your Compostela. Before the pilgrim mass, you can use a locker there. Mark. Okay. So. Oops. So the... We've given you this session today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Provided free of charge, 
but we would ask you to consider making a donation to this wonderful, this wonderful charity in Spain, a registered charity, Age in Spain. It's very simple to find, ageinspain.org. Now, my email address is there. If, if, uh, if you've got any questions that arise as you prepare for your Camino or whenever, just email me and Mark and I will get together and we'll answer your questions. And with that, could we all just, in the usual fashion, thank Mark for his time in writing the guidebook and in preparing the presentation for us today. Thank you very much. <laughs> there we are. Buen Camino, everyone. Buen Camino. Buen Camino. Buen Camino. Buen Camino. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, thank you. Bye, Janice. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Enjoy this case. So you're going to walk it, keys. Say so what? Have you have you walked the English way yet? I did. I did in 2021. I carried your oh, book yeah. with. Me. Oh, and brilliant. Yeah, just you had just finished it when I got to Santiago and we got together for beer with you and me. And, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That was the first time we met face to face. It was wonderful. Let the me get this straight. You guys went for a drink and never invited me. Say what? It won't you, happen guys next time. Went, you went for a drink and didn't invite Johnny Walker. We couldn't find you. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't met you yet. For all the times I've been to Santiago, I hope to meet you. I won't be oh, there. This let me know the next time you're coming. Yeah, I'm walking from uh, Canterbury to Rome this oh, year. Oh, gosh. In yeah. one go. In what? In, in one journey. Yes. Uh, now, it may take me longer than 90 days, so I have walked it from Lucca to, to Rome before. Oh, so well, once I get to Lucca, 